you ever pondered how the seemingly isolated worlds of traditional finance, central bank, digital currencies and decentralised finance could be interconnected? Well, today's episode invites you into the forefront of blockchain technology's future. A future where cross-chain interoperability isn't just a possibility, it's a reality. And today we're going to be joined by Tem Louis, Vice President of OneChain, a visionary platform at the helm of decentralised cross-chain solutions. Tem is uniquely positioned to demystify the complexities of blockchain interoperability, and that is one of the many reasons I'm excited to get him on the podcast today. Because as this digital landscape evolves, the necessity for seamless communication and transfer between diverse blockchain networks is becoming undeniably critical. So I've invited Tem on to share with us why bridging these isolated ecosystems is vital for the scalability and the integration of blockchain technology into our financial systems. From that influence of cross-chain interoperability on the symbiotic relationship between traditional finance, CBDCs and DeFi, to the pressing need for industry-wide standards, we're going to explore the challenges and the breakthroughs that lie ahead. And if we've got time, I also want to explore why Ethereum's ERC-20 token is actually a beacon of hope in this quest for unity, and how OneChain's pioneering work in developing decentralised cross-chain bridges is not only enhancing DeFi infrastructure, but also paving the way for a more interconnected and efficient future. How does that sound? Now, before I get today's guest on, a quick shout out to the sponsors of Tech Talks Daily, because in today's remote first world, I think settling for outdated managed file transfer solutions means ultimately you're risking your sensitive data. But if you upgrade to KiteWorks, the gold standard in secure MFT, boasting FedRAMP moderate authorization, KiteWorks isn't just secure, it's a complete transformation of how your business handles file transfers and the communications. So say goodbye to compromise and hello to unmatched security and efficiency. And you can do that by making the switch to KiteWorks.com. Visit KiteWorks.com to begin. That's KiteWorks.com to secure your data and empower your business. But now, let's get today's guest on. Well, buckle up and hold on tight, because wherever you're listening in the world, I'm going to beam your ears all the way to London in the UK, where you too can pull up a chair, sit down with myself and Tem, as we attempt to light the path to a truly decentralised financial ecosystem. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. My name is Tamajin Louie. Everyone listening can just call me Tam. It's a lot easier. And I am the CEO of OneChain. OneChain is one of the earliest uh, decentralized blockchain interoperability protocols. Now, I know that is a uh, mouthful. I'm sure we'll get into it. But yes, we work on making different blockchain networks speak to one another, basically. Wow. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you join me on the podcast today. And you are someone with a decade of experience in pushing the envelope of emerging tech, particularly blockchain, and it is an incredibly cool topic. So the question I've got to ask, let's set the scene for our conversation today. How do you articulate the role of decentralized infrastructures in democratizing access to technology? And also, what's the origin story of one chain's focus on decentralized cross-chain interoperability? And I know it's a huge mouthful, and I've given you the biggest question in the world just to start, but where, would you like to begin by just telling me a little bit about them? And n- nice and easy question to kick things yeah, off. Yeah. But... No softballs here. <laughs> <laughs> but with, with this, I think it's good to, to maybe break it down. You know, democratizing access, this is an important idea, um, but it's also good to define it, I would say. So yeah. what it really just simply means is that you have equitable access and open participation. So, you know, this thing that exists is available to all people and will remain available to all people. So I think that's kind of how I like to define democratized access. And decentralized networks like blockchain, this is really where they thrive. Um, they are they have extremely low barriers to entry. Basically, anyone can go and interact with a decentralized blockchain. Um, they're also empowering in the sense of you know, data ownership and controlling the flow of information. This really kind of puts that power into the hand of the individual. There's also advantages in terms of 
security, you know, with a centralized system. Um, what you might also often encounter is like a singular component can fail and the whole thing comes down, at least theoretically with decentralized networks. You know, one piece can go offline without taking down the system. It's very redundant in that way. Um, and, you know, I guess more, more biased to what we are working on, decentralized networks also lend themselves very well to the creation of open interoperability standards or open standards um, overall. Um, so this is kind of very different from from the systems that exist today. You know, most certainly are centralized, which means that they're controlled and owned by a few large incumbent uh, monolithic companies, your Googles of the world and the like. Um, so it is it is um, you know quite a shift, but it is still mostly theoretical. Um, th- this beautiful vision of low barriers to entry, everyone controlling information, their own information and their own data, and everyone thriving together. This is the theory. In the implementation, there's still cracks. Um, the, the the individual crack that Wanchain is focused on is that interoperability element. Um, right now, there's many, many blockchain networks that exist. But blockchains, though decentralized, are awful at speaking to one another and sharing information. And so this is the specific crack that, that we at Wanchain are focused on, kind of building infrastructure that can help this data move from one chain to another. Without you know sacrificing the decentralization aspect that that spurred this whole movement, and what was it that inspired it all? Is there a story there? This usually, there usually is. Yeah, I think you know most myself included. Everyone at Wenchin, we we have very similar stories. Yeah. We encountered that original Bitcoin white paper, and it awoke something in us. Um, but then once you start looking at, at at the specifics, you kind of kind of you kind of see where work still needs to be done. It's a great idea, but at some point you have to get get down in the weeds. And very, very early on, we just realized that one blockchain network is not going to be enough to run the whole world on it. You know, We want to do more than have blockchain be a payment system. Um, we want it to really kind of operate a lot of the world's systems beyond finance. And with that, we just need multiple networks working together. We had a lot of learnings from the Web2 space you know, the transition from a local area network to a wide area network. You know, this is conceptually the same thing that we're trying to do now with blockchains from one blockchain network to multiple blockchain networks. Uh, now, just to expand on the definition of everything you're doing, you did a great job of putting it in a language that everyone can understand. And I know another, so there's also a huge significance of scaling up the connections between isolated blockchain ecosystem so can you expand on why this is so pivotal for the future of blockchain technology and also how this could potentially reshape the landscape of digital finance yeah absolutely you know as i I just mentioned finance is definitely one of the early use cases for this type of technology but our long-term vision we want to expand beyond finance you know there can be things like supply chains there can be all, all sorts of different real um real world centralized systems that exist today, you know, that we want to bring on to blockchain so that it can also take advantage of these systemic advantages. Um, but it really has to scale up. One chain is simply not enough. You know, there's one example I like to share that I think really helps um, people kind of understand why interoperability and why multiple chains working together is important. So, you know, don't quote me on the exact numbers. I'm going to be doing some rounding here. Um, but there's, what, about 8 billion people in the world today and 86,000 or so seconds in a day. Now, if we want the whole world to run on on blockchain, that's going to be a huge number of transactions that that need to take place on chain. Now, if we just wanted to give each person a single transaction per day, just one one per day, then you need an excess of 90,000 transactions per second to kind of sustain that level of volume. Now, that's just one. You know, I, myself as an individual, I might do... 100 in a day, just me. Um, if you want to really onboard kind of real world industries, the stock market, you know, a single marketplace like NASDAQ, they'll do what, 30 plus million transactions per day. So the scale of this, of the world is immense and decentralized systems and blockchains and the, as they exist today as isolated networks, you know, simply cannot handle that type of volume. And so that's why it's important to scale. That's why it's important to, um, have all these distinct networks kind of operate as a single meta network and that's why we need uh, interoperability 
Um, cross-chain interoperability seems to be the cornerstone for bridging traditional finance, uh, central bank digital currencies, and decentralized finance. And with that is a whole lot of shortened buzzwords that we all hear, TradFi, CBDCs, and DeFi, etc. But can you elaborate on how you envision this relationship evolving with the correct scalability measures in place? Because it's an incredibly complex uh, area, isn't it? Yes, it certainly is. And, you know, with these these buzzwords, as, as you yes. mentioned, I think these oftentimes are placeholders to mean mass adoption. Yeah. When can the real world start using these types of systems so it can grow beyond the kind of DeFi niche? And, you know, I think one thing that's extremely clear right now is that at least traditional finance and decentralized finance, they're already eyeing each other. They both see the synergies there, but it's just about figuring out how and when traditional finance can transition onto these decentralized networks. Now, there's a few reasons why it takes a lot of time. Um, the scale we talked about already, but it's more than just network throughput. It's also just the value in you know traditional finance. They're securing trillions of dollars, quadrillions of dollars on certain time scales, and when you're dealing with this type of value. You're not going to take risks with it. You know these aren't startups that are just going to you know th throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. They have to really kind of understand the systems, truly appreciate what all the the various risks are, and then they can act. And one of the problems is is that DeFi right now is still somewhat of a fractured mess. Um, it's a lot of different builders and different projects doing things their own way, and that's a mismatch. You know. Mm -hmm one signal for traditional finance to move on to decentralized networks or interact with DeFi is going to be clear regulation. And once you have, if you want to have clear regulations, you, you need some standards uh, in place in the industry as well. You know, right now, because everything is built ad hoc, everything is a little bit different. It's not really reasonable to expect regulators to understand in great detail all the variance in technology across the entire industry. Even people like myself who are in industry 24-7, okay, I might understand interoperability extremely well, but it doesn't mean I understand every corner of the blockchain industry to the same depth. So expecting a regulator to understand all of that is unreasonable. And I think that's where something like these standards um, that have to be put into place can really help. Um, I'm going to focus here just on interoperability again, because this is where where I know best. But yeah. you can define you know, some clear standards, some clear interfaces on how communication between the two networks has to work, how you vet and verify the authenticity of the data and put these best practices into place. Once these are in place and adopted by enough people in the industry, that's a blueprint that regulators can follow. Then you know there's lots of ways that they can think about regulating that they can do it via in different tiers or, or, or what have you. But at least there's something that is there that's tangible that can be used to properly educate the regulators so that they, when defining the regulations, you know, can strike a good balance between you know, security and protecting the end user and promoting innovation. And, you know, then once that that's in place, then it's kind of oh, open doors. You can now safely, Mr. TradFi, <laughs> go on and interact <laughs> um, with these with these systems. Um, so that's kind of how I see this interaction taking place. There's there's no doubt in my mind that that these various market players are going to converge. The advantages of decentralized networks are too clear, and there's not a lot of controversy amongst traditional finance and DeFi that there's additional value that can be created there. Um, it's just the nitty gritty right now that that still needs to put in place. A lot of it is being slowed down by by regulations, but I think one step deeper is regulations are slowed down because there's still too much variance. There's not enough standards in place. And it does, excuse me, it does feel like we've been talking about increasing adoption in this space and the excitement around it since, what, 2017, when it, when the world went a little bit crazy around blockchain. But the absence of industry-wide standards are, does appear from the outside looking in to be a, a roadblock in the path of widespread blockchain adoption. So, what do you say are the main challenges this presents and, and how is it hindering the growth of a, a financially inclusive future? Because that's always been the, the ideal destination. That's where we need to get to. But 
what's holding it back and and how's this going to improve do you think yeah i mean you're totally right <laughs> it feels like we've been talking about yeah. uh kind of enterprise adoption for for 10 years um <laughs> and you know there's been experiments of course but but it's clear that it's not really happened yet um and, and as you rightly pointed out i think a lot of that is due to the lack of, of um of standards mm. even internally you know it, it having a lack of standards creates certain obstacles and it's nothing kind of groundbreaking if you think about it for just a few moments it makes a lot of sense you know if everyone is building the things the way they want to build it it becomes a little bit difficult to trust every single one you know it's a huge task then to kind of go in and understand in great detail where all the risks are present based on a certain design especially if you have to then vet 10,000 different designs that are not following any kind of shared language. Um, and so there's security concerns in that sense. You know, even as Wanchain ourselves, you know, we build this type of infrastructure. If we connect our infrastructure to another maker's infrastructure and we're not following the same standards, we're exposing our system where we always, of course, prioritize security, but we expose it to the, the risk assumptions that another builder might have decided. Maybe they decided to do different trade-offs than, than we would have done. So it makes it difficult to kind of connect two other systems that way. And, you know, that is kind of counter to the ethos of interoperability, but it's just the reality of the situation because security always has to be number one. And similarly, um, the user experience is not seamless at all. And that, that, that in itself is going to always be a roadblock for mainstream adoption so long as it can't be, you know, quick and easy. In the Web2 world, they've gotten really good at making nice experiences convenient and allowing the user to simply focus on the thing that they want to accomplish and not have to worry about what's going on behind the scenes. It's not like that in blockchain right now. <laughs> um, yeah. You still have to know which blockchain you're interacting with. There's a lot of manual intervention for end users. So this is simply just too complex. Here again, I think when you once you have standards, particularly for interoperability, it'll make it easier for application developers to abstract a lot of that away so that it can be a more seamless uh, user experience for, for the end user. Um, and I think this, you know, I think, I, I, I think I talked about this a little bit just now in the security part, but just the fact that everything is ad hoc makes it very difficult to, to onboard the mainstream. Um, so I think we really need more of a, a shift in thinking. We need to think about these type of, um, systems, blockchain interoperability really as being core infrastructure in the sense core infrastructure should be zero profit, uh, condition endeavors. And then once you have the shared, secure, vetted core infrastructure in place, you know, then you can kind of go and build products on top of that, that uh, have different, offer different value, um, does different trade-offs for different types of users, and you can kind of compete there. Um, but we're still at the point now where we're trying to get everyone to really focus on building this core interoperability infrastructure. Yeah, I think it's something you see with any emerging technologies. We're kind of seeing a few parallels with AI, arguably, at the moment, where AI has been around for a long, long time, but it wasn't till Gen AI almost just lowered that barrier of entry and, oh, I can just type stuff and it gives stuff back. People yeah. kind of got it. The world goes crazy for it. Now people are starting to think, hey, we need to regulate this. We could be causing more harm than good. We're putting our <laughs> company data into large language learning models. and, and it's, it's very similar, isn't it, really? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of similarities. Luckily, um, I, I think blockchain is slightly less of a, ominous black box in terms of yeah. what's going on behind the scenes you know a lot of it is transparent and provable so that is an advantage to to blockchain but um yeah all these type of revolution or potentially revolutionizing technologies they all kind of go through the same um kind of growth pains on the way up as the industries mature and realize okay yes you might have had this amazing ethos at the start for decentralization open access to all but um if you want to onboard the whole world you know you need regulation. You need you, you need the the systems that are in place to protect consumers to be compatible with the thing that you're building. And this is often where there's uh, growing pains. Hundred percent with you. And Ethereum's ERC twenty token, the, the standard there is often held as one of the biggest success stories for creating a a, a universal template. Really. So, how do you view that ERC twenty as an ideal model for maybe establishing industry wide standards and do you think there are any lessons that could be learned from this implementation? 
Absolutely. I, I love the ERC-20 example. It's it's really good for illustrating the importance of these type of standards throughout the entire industry in, you know, to people who are not focused on interoperability 24-7, which is uh, everyone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, ERC-20, for those, for those listeners who might not know, it's a standard token interface um, that originated on the Ethereum blockchain. So basically just, you know, introduce a, a token standard that everyone could follow when they're deploying their tokens on Ethereum. And the advantages then were that that standard kind of became interoperable interoperable within Ethereum. App, all sorts of different ap- applications can just automatically interact with it. Um, and it really allowed the ecosystem to boom. Now, if you didn't have this type of standard that this that everyone followed, you probably still could have built out an ecosystem. You could have built a decentralized exchange um, the difference would have been every single token that the decentralized exchange wanted to support would require an engineering lift. You would have to build that integration in ad hoc. Then you could also have other applications support that same token, but it would be the same thing. You know, Each application, each wallet, each lending platform, they would have to go in and do the engineering work for every single token that's following its own standard just to be able to use it. But because you had ERC-20, now it can just spread. Okay. Everyone knows what type of data structure to look for. And I can go, you know, issue a new ERC-20 right now. And right out of the box, it'll work on all the DEXs on Ethereum, all the lending platform. Well, lending platform is slightly different, but all the DEXs, all the wallets, they can immediately use my, my ERC-20 token. Now, this sounds way better than everyone doing it ad hoc one by one, because you really can't see that scale. If everyone, every single time you wanted to uh, support any token, you have to you know, hire new engineers and then integrate it. And that's kind of the state of interoperability today. We can build bridges between any two blockchain networks, essentially. But every time we want to deploy a new bridge, it's an ad hoc construction. It's a new engineering task. And every single piece has to be built one by one. And then when you zoom out, what you look at is, okay, well, now it sort of works. It's not very seamless. And there's a million mission critical failure points. You know, any one of these ad hoc constructions goes down, then it causes problems throughout the entire system. With a standard, that standard has to be obviously extremely well vetted and secured. Um, But once that standard is created and in place, then it can spread. Then you can have widespread adoption. Then it scales up very quickly. And you and your team are right at the forefront of developing decentralized cross-chain bridging solutions. So as someone that's right in the eye of the storm, anything you can share around how these solutions work, especially for people listening that are hearing about it for the first time, and also their impact on enhancing efficiency of DeFi infrastructure, because we're solving real-world problems here. Like that's something that often gets missed with all the, the hype and excitement. Yeah, absolutely. So if we zoom out a little bit, you know, Wanchain, I think I mentioned the top were um, blockchain interoperability project focused mostly on R&D. You know, we are actively yeah. working with our industry partners trying to set up these um, uh, or, or get these industry standards in place. Um, but we do have you know, forward facing products as well. Um, we have cross chain bridges. We actually launched the industry's first ever cross chain bridge back in 2018. Um, and we we support a variety of different types of, of bridges. We do um, fungible tokens. So these would be things like your ETH or your BTC or your USDT. We also do NFT bridges. A lot of the listeners, I'm sure, have heard NFTs during that last uh, the last craze when everyone went crazy over the uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the monkey images. Um, <laughs> and we do cross-chain message passing, which is basically moving data from one chain to another. But that's basically what interoperability in the blockchain sphere is. It's the capabilities to move data in one way, shape, or form that exists on one network and transport it to another network, lossless, identical, and then transactions can continue. Um, so it's really about moving data from any chain to any chain. And that's that's what that's that's you know what we do. But if you want to think about how what you need to think about when evaluating these different types of systems is that process of moving data from one chain to a second chain, this is really where you need to kind of vet the system. And this is really where the systems differentiate from one another. So in one chain's case, what we prioritize is that transfer mechanism has to be as decentralized as the underlying blockchain networks themselves. 
this is usually not the case with interoperability protocols out there right now. You know, it's quicker <laughs> uh, if you're focused on growth first and foremost to have that piece centralized. You can have just a single actor, you know, copy and pasting data from one chain to another. Um, that's easier to build and you can spread faster. Um, but for us, you know, as I mentioned, I think probably ad nauseum at this point is that we view interoperability as core infrastructure. So we really can't sacrifice on on security and decentralization. Um, and that's kind of where OneChain sets itself apart. And as we touched on very early in our conversation today, accessibility and user experience, these are the things that are crucial for the adoption of blockchain by the general public. And maybe people listening around the world are again hearing about you for the first time. So how are you addressing these aspects in your technology and, and equally the narrative as well to to reach that wider audience beyond the technically savvy and ultimately increase adoption? Well, great question. On the user experience side of things, Wenchain and ourselves have pioneered a few innovations, let's call them, yeah. that made the experience um, you know, more seamless than it was before. I'm not saying it's perfect yet, <laughs> but it's an improvement. Um, you know, I can think back at our first bridge, which, I, as I mentioned, was the first bridge uh, or the first decentralized bridge. Back then, it required multiple clicks or you know, the user had to do things multiple times to complete uh, a single transaction. They had to go on the you know one network, do a sign a transaction there, grab some some data, copy, paste it, go somewhere else, paste it there, sign another transaction on the second chain, and now you're done. Okay. So that's kind of how it looked like in, in the first iteration. Today, it's a single click. The user just presses one button and then everything else happens in the, in the background. So everything has been kind of abstracted out, at least to this extent. Um, and, you know, I think that will be the key to, to continuing to improve the user experience is we really just have to abstract it away. Um, if you think about, you know, your, your relatives who are using Facebook and things like that, it's, it's a big ask to have them go download, um, you know, multiple, blockchain wallets and figure out what different tokens they need just to be able to use it. That all has to just be kind of abstracted out so they can focus on the applications, you know, that they want to actually interact with. Um, so it's really just about making it as easy as possible and removing a lot of that complexity from the surface. Um, but I think the second, the second part of the question you asked was about reaching beyond the tech savvy. Yeah. This I think is more difficult and and where there's still even more work to do um, as an industry as a whole, um, not only Wen Chang. But I guess our thesis is that once you have universal standards, it'll make the whole ecosystem, the whole industry more seamless. And then application developers will be empowered to build applications that actually run on multiple blockchains seamlessly. And again, to abstract away all of that complexity so that when you're talking to regular people who are not extremely tech savvy and into the blockchain world, you don't have to mention the word blockchain at all. You know, as as long as the the end user needs to know what blockchain they're interacting with, that means we're not there yet. Um, and we're not ready for for true mainstream adoption, as long as that's still part of the conversation and part of the narrative. Um, for us, we're focused on building the infrastructure that makes it possible and Application developers, I think, once that is in place, are the ones that are really going to have to reach out beyond the tech savvy. Because blockchain itself is still very complicated to use and, and you can say is more appropriate or more feasible is probably a better word for tech savvy people to use. Does that frustrate you at all? The fact that we've been talking about this for more than 10 years and, and like, come on, guys, we've been talking about this for 10 years. Don't, <laughs> why don't you get it yet? Do, do, do you ever have those little random moments or rants? Definitely, definitely random moments. Uh, the frustration will will come, but then I zoom out and then I feel better because we've made a lot of progress um, in the, you know, the past decade. And we often look to other industries to comfort ourselves. Um, in, we, we, you know, part of the conversation is this Web3 idea um, that is powered by blockchain. So we often look at what Web2 went through and Web1 and the journey for the internet or, or you know, web two even decades long as well um from the from the origins of the technology to revolutionizing e-commerce online that was also extremely long time horizon so when you look at it that way um we're still early in the blockchain timeline 
And so it becomes less frustrating. Um, but definitely there'll be moments here and there where it's like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and you're also someone that's deeply engaged with the blockchain community and a speaker at so many prominent events uh, like the Cardano Summit, for example. So how do you approach conversations about interoperability and enterprise adoption among so many different diverse stakeholders in this space? Because one thing we've not uh, touched on yet is your cross-chain infrastructure empowers developers to build the future of Web3. So how, how do you start those conversations and, and get those diverse stakeholders in um, in place? Yeah, I mean, it sounds very basic, I guess, but it, it all yeah. starts with just acknowledging and understanding that not everyone is focused on interoperability every single day of every single year. <laughs> and so, um, you know, there has to be both teaching and kind of learning going on. Um, it's really at this stage still just having conversations, still trying to communicate the importance of decentralized interoperability. Um, and if you're talking to someone that's in the industry, also the importance of supporting not only Ethereum-like systems, EVM systems, but also uh, more heterogeneous networks um, and the importance of that. But it also, especially when speaking to um, regulators and and uh people in, in the traditional finance world or in traditional enterprises, also listening to what their concerns are and how they're thinking about uh, blockchain in terms of their needs. Um, and that's an important thing to, to learn from my side as well. Um, with enterprises, it's a little bit different because those who are engaging with blockchain right now actually have been in blockchain yeah. experimentally for a very long time. Um, some of the earliest innovators in blockchain were some of these huge uh, enterprises like Microsoft, JP Morgan, and things like that. And they're running their own experiments. And a lot of the things that we learned in the public sector, um, you know, originated from their experiments also. So when we talk to the enterprises, you can be a little more granular. Um, you can caution against things like single solution approaches and really kind of hammer away at the need for core infrastructure and, you know, infrastructure first, product second, that type of approach. Um, and, yeah, really, it's just still at the stage. You just have to have these conversations, that, and it's still at the stage of of explaining why it's so important and why it's indeed a prerequisite for mainstream adoption. You know, like you, like we mentioned earlier, you go through these hype cycles and you get these these periods where everyone wants to run onto blockchain and and everyone's really excited, and we're entering one of those phases now. But it's likely going to be very similar, maybe slightly larger than the previous cycles. But I doubt we're going to get to the end point of um, true mainstream adoption in this cycle either, because some of the prerequisite infrastructure is not yet in place. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast today, demystifying this space, talking about it in a language that everyone can understand. It is incre- It's a gift to be able to do that. And I'm going to finish now by asking you possibly the most difficult question for you, and that is a song that you can add to our Spotify playlist or a book to our Amazon wish list to leave everyone listening with. All I'm going to ask is what would you like to leave everyone listening with and why? Yeah, um, great question. One book that was very impactful to me is called Power, A Radical View by Stephen uh, Stephen Luke's. And um, this really kind of helps shape the way that I think about incumbent power structures and the impact of new ideology on the existing institutions. Um, it's a book that's, uh, that that originated in the in the seventies and was quite influential in this field um, and has been revised a few times since then. I think they're in their third edition now, um, but really just helps think about what power is, what power is power and how power is legitimized. Um, it's a little difficult to go into m- more detail right now, but I think it's very, very much worth a read, especially for those who are interested in disruptive technologies uh, and why it is so often the case that when there is something new like this that emerges, it receives such fervent blowback from the incumbent systems. Oh, wow. You left me with a huge teaser there. I'm going to be checking that out. I'll get it added to our Amazon wish list. And for anyone listening, whether they be a developer, someone following the space closely, wanting to get involved, wanting to join your community, 
Where's the best starting point for all things outland chain? I would imagine you've got things like Medium, Telegram, GitHub, and your website. Mm-hmm. But wh- where would you guide everyone? Yeah, the number one place to go to stay up to date will be our Twitter or our X. Um, our handle is wanchain underscore org. Yeah. That's number one. We're very active there. Um, and then number two would just be our website, wanchain.org. And with those two, those two channels, you can get up to date pretty quickly. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your insights that scalability and implementation of industry-wide uh, standards, they could be the next hurdles to face. But not only that, you've also demystified this space, talked about it in a language which everyone can understand. So I just thank you for taking the time to do that with me today. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and I really enjoyed our talk. So as we wrap up today's enlightening conversation, I think so as we wrap up today's conversation, I think it's clear that the journey towards that fully interoperable blockchain ecosystem is challenging, but equally exhilarating. And that vision of connecting isolated blockchain networks, fostering a seamless exchange of assets and establishing industry-wide standards, yes, it's no small feat. And I'm conscious that in attempting to demystify this space, we may have oversimplified some of the challenges in making that happen. But I confidently believe that with innovators like Tem and platforms like OneChain, the blueprint for that unified financial future, it really is slowly but surely coming into focus. And I love how Tem was reflecting on the rise of Web2 and e-commerce and how long that world took. Maybe we just need to be a little bit more patient. But of course, there are implications of such technological advancements and they extend far beyond the realms of TradFi, CBDCs, DeFi, and all those other buzzwords that hint at a world where financial inclusivity and efficiency, they're really not just ideals, buzzwords. They're really not just a set of ideals, nice-to-haves and buzzwords, but a reality. So as we all collectively ponder the potential of that cross-chain interoperability and how it might revolutionise our digital and financial landscape, I think one question remains. How can we all contribute to that transformative journey? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this discussion today. So please share your insights on anything you think we missed from the conversation today, anything you think about the future of blockchain interoperability. Please share your views with me, techblogwriteroutlook.com. If you want to come on the podcast and join me, we can do that too. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, just at Neil C. Hughes. Let's continue this conversation beyond the airwaves. And together, maybe we can navigate the complexities of emerging technologies and ultimately unlock the full potential of decentralised finance for all. But that's it for today. So just a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. 